And uh, let me get um, some introduction in here. I'm David Miller. I'm with IEC Time Systems. Uh, we're glad to host today's webinar. Uh, IEC is based home office is in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We have also an office in Nashville. We've been established since 1959. Uh, we provide organizations with time, payroll, and HCM solutions, as well as fast, friendly, and professional support. Uh, we know, again, your time is valuable, and we hope you take away uh, one, if not more, uh, practical action steps on today's topic. Little housekeeping notes, you gotta have those, right? <laughs> today's webinar is approved for one HRCI credit, and we will get that information to you after the webinar. Everyone will start out muted just to kind of reduce that background noise. And today's webinar is being recorded and we'll send you a link to that as well. Uh, we'll have a Q&A time near our uh, end of the session today. And we'll, you can also put your questions ahead of time so you don't forget them in the comment box and uh, or chat box. And we'll be glad to get to those. And if we don't happen to get to them, we can also address them later if you get them in that chat box. So uh, feel free to put any kind of questions at any time in the chat box. The slides of the speaker's webinar will also be emailed to everyone that attends today as well. Unemployment insurance, how COVID has affected it and your bottom line, that's today's topic. The impacts of COVID-19 legislation on unemployment will start out uh, our bullet points then how unemployment insurance is compiled and how it affects you as an employer of record. How unemployment expenses are impacted by uh, employment practices and termination processes. How your rate is compiled and how much tax you pay on what wages. And finally, how to proactively reduce and maintain your SUI rates. Today's speaker is Curtis Uptons Jr. And he does have quite a bit of credentials. I just like to share those with you so you know where our speaker is sort of coming from today. And he's got so many, in fact, that I think what I'm gonna do is just sort of uh, pause momentarily at each of these screens, just so you could you know, kind of get an introduction to those and, uh, and see those. All right, now just a little bit of additional information, just a, and a reminder actually, that we will send you the code for that HRCI credit and uh, to apply for it, and also uh, respond to those chat items and those slides will be addressed to you. And again, I thank you for showing uh, today and joining us. And now we'll let our speaker, Curtis Upkins, switch over to his presentation. I got to stop my screen though, so he can do it. <laughs> there you go. All right, uh, I have my screen up now, so let's go in presentation mode. All right, um, thank you, David, for the introduction. Thank you also for the in invitation to talk about unemployment insurance management. Um, I've been in unemployment insurance management for quite some time. Uh, when you read David's introduction, you'll see that uh, I've probably been in, in the business longer than that picture uh, that he put up. I, I do appreciate him for putting up uh, what I've identified as my uh, obituary uh, picture. You know, uh, it's considerably younger than the present age. I have grown my uh, COVID beard, so, and it came out great. Uh, thank you guys for joining us today. I want to just give you a little bit of information about Savio HR Solutions before we get started. Um, 
our company has been in business since 1977. Uh, we started off as a for-profit division of the Mississippi Hospital Association and were created to serve um, the unemployment cost management for hospitals in the state of Mississippi. And we did that for a very long time. Uh, over the years, we saved the hospitals millions and millions of dollars in unemployment insurance cost management savings. And so um, in, I think in 2010, 2000. Nine, we decided to expand our services to other industries. Uh, and so today we serve 160 clients in uh, I think 38, 39 states. Um, and uh, you know, we, we've expanded to multiple industries. We serve manufacturing, uh, trucking and transportation, warehousing, uh, healthcare, uh, electric power, uh, so we have uh, diversified in many uh, industries. So let's, let's let's talk about things about unemployment insurance management and, and why it's important to employers. So I want to start with a couple of really key facts about unemployment. Um, and, and the first one I really want you to understand uh, is that unemployment is job insurance. And the fact is, it is 100% funded by employers. So you fund the unemployment insurance system 100%. Uh, so your tax dollars or your uh, reimbursement to the system, if you're a reimbursable employer, both pays for unemployment insurance benefits and pays for the employees and facilities and supplies utilized by the system uh, to distribute and pay unemployment insurance benefits. So you are the boss of that system, you fund it. And so uh, all the money that they get is yours. The other thing I like to emphasize is that it is a short-term program. Uh, it was set up for individuals that are out of work due to no fault of their own. Uh, initially, you had to be laid off to draw unemployment. So if an employer had an economic downturn and had to cut his workforce through a rift, um, then those individuals were allowed to draw unemployment insurance benefits. The system was created to keep uh, skilled workers uh, from being migratory. Uh, in the past, before unemployment, uh, if one industry shut down, if one business had an economic downturn and those employees were laid off, typically that, that skill set, that skilled employee would leave the area to find work somewhere else. But uh, unemployment was created to have a bridge to gap, a bridge to uh, cover the gap in unemployment so that person could find other employment in that particular area. Uh, unemployment is not a welfare system. So you don't get unemployment insurance because you have a need for unemployment. You could be a multimillionaire. And, and if you're laid off on the, on the um, eligible conditions, uh, you have base period wages that can be computed, you can draw on employment. So it's not a welfare or entitlement program. The only thing that entitles you to unemployment insurance is your work history and the reasons that you were separated from employment. Um, good separation management uh, can significantly lower your unemployment insurance rates. And we will talk about that uh, in depth in just a couple of minutes. But just wanted to give you those uh, key facts about the UI program and UI system. I'm gonna hit this slide really fast um, because it's basically an overview of the system. Uh, the unemployment process starts when an employee is terminated from your employment. They would go down to the Tennessee Unemployment Agency, file a claim. I take that back. They don't go to the agency anymore. Uh, they would either file a claim by telephone, um, by um, computer through the uh, agency's website, and that is done pretty, pretty quickly. So you terminate them uh, at 10 o'clock, by 12 o'clock, they have filed a claim. And when they file that claim, the clock starts to ticking on your responsibilities to respond to that UR claim. Uh, so when an employee files the claim, they, the agency obtains separation information from both sides. And that based on that information, they determine whether or not that individual is entitled to draw unemployment insurance benefits. I will say that a person has to be both monetarily eligible to draw benefits and he must meet separation eligibility to draw benefits. 
and we'll talk about both of those in just a minute. Uh, after uh, the initial investigation is done, the unemployment insurance agency will issue you a written decision telling you and the past employee whether or not uh, benefits will be paid on this particular claim. Uh, either party has the right to appeal that decision. So if the initial decision goes against you as an employer, you can file that appeal. If it goes against the claimant, then they also have the same rights. And uh, there are levels of appeals through the unemployment insurance system and through your state court. So the first level is the uh, administrative law judge, ALJ. Second stage is through um, a review board. And then finally, uh, outside of the uh, unemployment Ag insurance agency or state court appeals. Okay, we talked about a person has to be both monetarily eligible and non-monetarily eligible. So let's talk about monetary eligibility. So uh, when an individual files a claim for unemployment insurance benefits, uh, the Tennessee Unemployment Agency does a look back over the past 18 months to determine if that person has earned enough wages in that period of time to qualify monetarily for unemployment insurance benefits. Now, the state agency and the unemployment system call that a base period. In Tennessee, your base period is the first four of the last five completed quarters. Uh, we have completed, well, if somebody filed today, which is April 1st, uh, the calculation period used uh, to compute whether or not they have enough money to draw benefits would be the four quarters of 2020. In Tennessee, uh, when a claim is established, it is established for what they call a claim year, and a claim year is 52 weeks. An individual has um, can draw up to 26 weeks of benefits uh, within that 52-week period. Uh, in Tennessee, the weekly benefit amount, um, or uh, an employee can establish a claim for as little as $30 per week, and the maximum amount uh, weekly that a person can receive for unemployment is $275. When we were looking at the averages uh, in the Tennessee uh, unemployment insurance system, the average person or the average weekly benefit amount in the state of Tennessee is $215. So most people are going to draw around that amount per week. Um, right now, I was looking at what we call uh, unemployment duration, which measures the time that uh, a person draws uh, in a unemployment claim year. So in Tennessee right now, and this was uh, effective as of um, two weeks ago, the average uh, person who files a claim in the state of Tennessee draws a total of 16 weeks of unemployment insurance benefits. And, and that's, that's a, uh, an average number. I was looking at the US average. The US average is about uh, 19 weeks of uh, benefits drawn within a claim year. Uh, a person can draw a maximum of $7,150 in the state of Tennessee. And that's uh, the maximum benefit amount of $275 times 26 weeks. So that covers monetary eligibility. The next thing, if a person qualifies monetarily, then the next thing that happens is that they have to determine based on the separation from the last employer, should that person be qualified to draw unemployment? That's what we call a non-monetary decision or non-monetary eligibility. So it's really important for employers to respond uh, to the unemployment insurance agency. Uh, anytime a person files a claim and qualify monetarily, the employer receives a notice that a claim has been filed against their account and the state agency requests separation information. Most states give you from three to 21 days to reply to that. Tennessee, I think it's about five days from when you receive that written notice. And in Tennessee, if you do not respond promptly, 
even if you subsequently get a disqualification and none charge, the weeks paid in the interim will usually be charged back to that employer's account. An example would be uh, you receive a notice to respond to a separated employee. Uh, they give you five days to respond. No response is received within that five days. So based on the information that the ex-employee gives, they decide that this person is entitled to draw the benefits. Uh, the employee may have been fired for fighting, but when they went in to file a claim, they told the unemployment agency, I was laid off due to lack of work. Since there's no information on file to that contrary, to contrary to what the employee gave, uh, the agency will make a decision based on that. So uh, they would start to pay that individual. You as an employee realize, oh my gosh, um, three weeks ago, I got a notice that this person was filing a claim. I did not respond promptly. So now three weeks later, I'm gonna respond. The agent will, agency will still take your response. However, if that individual has been paid benefits, um, they will continue to receive benefits until another decision is issued. And you as an employer will be liable for charges um, for all those benefit paid uh, because there was not a timely and prompt response. And all of those benefit paid would affect your uh, experience rate. Uh, a, disqualification, a disqualification prevents the person from ever beginning to draw benefits. So that's important to us because of no benefits paid. There's no potential for liability on the employer or charges against the employer. Uh, if a decision is allowed, that allowance and payments continue until a different decision is made. And I was working with the state of uh, North Carolina and we had a similar situation and it took them three months to make an initial decision. So for, if that was Tennessee, all those benefit paid during that three months period would be chargeable back to you. Even if we did subsequently get a disqualification. Okay. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, we will address them as we go along. If, if you want to address your, you know, your questions verbally, I ask those questions verbally, then we will set aside some time at the end of this presentation to do that. The decisions or the issues that uh, we see most are separation issues and separation issues are generally voluntary or involuntary separations. Other uh, decisions that we see are uh, fraud cases and fraud cases are are really, really high at this time. Uh, we have identity theft criminals out there stealing people's identity and drawing benefits based on uh, those individuals, uh, social security number and wages earned. We'll talk about that a little bit later too. Uh, we see working part-time oftentimes, uh, especially during COVID, we may have had a person who was working a full-time job and working with you in a part-time capacity uh, they lost their full-time job, but they continued to work with you. So they went and filed a claim for unemployment insurance benefits. Because they are not uh, fully employed, they may be eligible for what we call a part total claim. And a part total claim is when your weekly earnings are less than your weekly entitlement to unemployment insurance benefits, then you can draw unemployment based on the difference of those two numbers. So if you um, earn $100 uh, a week in a part-time job and your unemployment uh, weekly benefit amount is $275, you would be entitled to the difference of $100 and $275, which would be uh, $175 a week you could draw. Plus most states give what we call an honesty bonus. Um, and that honesty bonus uh, allows them to get, I think 40 additional dollars in the state of Tennessee. We say to, to prevent claims from being play, paid, um, all issues should be fully investigated prior to a termination occurring. Uh, we should uh, utilize extremely uh, high level documentation of uh, all infractions or issues that come about during the course of an employment. 
Now, one of the rules of thumbs that, that we utilize uh, is that what is uttered should be written and what is written should be uttered. Uh, that simply means that if you provide an employee with a verbal coaching, a verbal counseling, or a verbal warning, uh, you should also reduce that verbal uh, action to writing. Let the employee know that this is simply a verbal reprimand or a verbal coaching, but we will uh, document in your file that you and I had this conversation. Uh, the same is true if you give an employee a written warning. I've seen many supervisors who just want to write down the, the issue that caused the warning and then just present it to the employee for the employee to read, or some only some put the warning in the employee's uh, paycheck and never really want to discuss it. But if you give a written warning, you should uh, talk to that employee about why they're receiving that warning and what actions they can take to rectify the situation. But more importantly, you should tell the employee the consequences of not correcting the situation. Uh, it's also very important that uh, we terminate employees timely. Uh, if there's an extreme time lapse between the final incident that we say caused the termination and the actual termination, that more than likely will result in that claim being paid. Uh, a for instance, in that situation is I work in healthcare and uh, when joint commission uh, accreditation time comes, uh, we do things differently. Uh, when I was working at St. Dominic's, we'd have an employee who would have violated a policy that would result in termination, but a supervisor would come to me and say, hey, look, we have an inspection coming up in two weeks. What I would like to do is let's just let the person work for those two weeks. We will pass inspection and after inspection, we'll let them go. Uh, a termination like that would result in a payment of benefits. Plus it's not ethical to, um, what I say, use an employee in that manner. If a person violates a policy that will lead to termination, we should terminate them today. If we're in an investigative process, then we should terminate them as soon as we complete our investigation. Again, uh, properly document and um, promptly respond to the agency with separation information. Um, misconduct. Uh, an employee is disqualified for unemployment if they're discharged for misconduct connected with the work. Different states have variation in the way that they just in the way that they define uh, misconduct. We've put four common definitions of misconduct uh, on your screen. Uh, generally, the biggest is a person who refuses an order or refuses to perform. Uh, their duty is good, guilty of misconduct because they have committed uh, insubordination. A person who uh, fails to meet performance standard when they've shown the ability to perform at the level that the employer desire could be considered misconduct. Carelessness of such a nature as to be considered culpable would also be considered misconduct. And, and culpable negligence would be something that a person would do that any ordinary uh, person would realize could cause harm or uh, danger uh, to injury in that person's incident. And, and I'd like to give an example, uh, a situation we had where uh, we had a maintenance person who was responsible for changing light bulbs uh, up in the ceiling. And so uh, in this situation, he was using a rolling chair with wheels on it to climb up in the chair, reach up high and change the light bulbs. Well, that could be culpable negligence because any reasonable person can predict the outcome. As he's reaching, get off balance, he's gonna make the chair roll, fall, injure himself. And, and that's what happened. So that's what we call the reasonable person rule. The other major separation issue that we face is um, voluntary separations, when a person voluntarily quits their job. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult if a person just quit their job and then go for file for unemployment insurance. Uh, when a person quits voluntarily, uh, the burden of proof is on that person to show that they had good cause within the meaning of the law for leaving that job. 
and good causes can be if they left for illness, they were no longer able to perform the job. If they were injured, they could not perform the standard uh, physical aspects of the job that could be considered good cause. Um, if they have report, reported uh, workplace harassment or a hostile work environment uh, and the company does not take any action to rectify that situation and they quit um, because they perceive that they are uh, being harassed or bullied, then that can constitute good cause for leaving employment. It's just a couple examples of what may constitute good cause. There, there are several others. Uh, when a person has come to you and tell you that they are uh, resigning from their position, we request that you always request a written resignation. Does not mean that you'll always get one. If a person uh, calls in and say, I'm quitting, chances are you're not going to get a written resignation. But what we've seen in our unemployment proceedings, a lot of times a person will come in and say, look, I'm giving you my two weeks notice. I'm going to be quitting the job. Um, then after they're separated, they will go to the unemployment agents and say, hey, look, they fired me for no reason at all. At all. I use the employer, you go in and say, hey, look, they resigned from the job and worked out the resignation. One of the first questions is going to be, uh, do you have a copy of the written resignation? If, if you do not, then it becomes a situation of uh, one person's word against the other. Unless you have uh, a third party that witnessed this discussion, that type of decision can go either way. And I'm going to tell you, if you do hearings in Massachusetts, the uh, law judges are going to take the word over the claimant, over employers every single time. Because their reasoning is the employer should have known to get the resignation in writing. And because of that failure, they pay them every time if you don't have a written resignation. And there are conflicting statements about the separation. Okay, so let's let's move forward and do a little quick recap. So uh, first of all, uh, we've the person is qualified for benefits, so he is monetarily eligible for benefits. We've gone through the non-mon uh, decision-making process and the um, adjudicator determines that this person is not entitled to receive benefits. That person disagrees with the decision of the adjudicator. They have the right to file an appeal to an administrative law judge. When you go before an administrative law judge, um, it is essential that you are prepared. A couple reasons. You are making an official record of this person's separation. And anytime you're making a official legal record, you should want it as complete and as accurate as possible. Uh, unemployment hearing uh, transcripts or tapes are subpoenable in other arenas. So if a person wins at the unemployment insurance level and they file an EEOC case, EEOC can subpoena unemployment insurance re records. If a person uh, files a wrongful discharge, uh, the hearing record for an unemployment insurance case can be subpoenaed. So we say we should be fully prepared. We should uh, produce a full, complete, and accurate record, and therefore we have to prepare ourselves for that. When you're doing um, a hearing or going before an administrative law judge, it is important that the person who knows the most about the situation is the one who's present for the hearing. So you need firsthand testimony from firsthand witnesses. Um, it is not enough to testify from the record because under the um, rules of evidence, uh, that is considered hearsay testimony and cannot be cross-examined. Employees should have signed your policies and procedures, and you should have a copy of that signed acknowledgement prepared to submit as evidence in the hearing. Exhibits, any warnings, uh, photographs, videos, tapes, text messages, email messages that prove your case, we should have pulled and had copies of those. 
And in, in unemployment cases, uh, you're required to submit a copy of those uh, documents of evidence to both the administrative law judge and to the terminated employee uh, that is participating in the case. If you have internal grievance procedures and that person did not access the internal grievance procedures, that type of uh, negligence could uh, work to your favor. We frequently said that uh, this person received warnings throughout the process. Uh, each one of our warnings uh, allows the employee to file an internal grievance. They grieve none of the written warnings. So we assume that that person uh, felt that they were uh, accurate and correct and accepted them. Uh, that type of testimony can sway a case in your favor. Prep time for your main witnesses is very important. When we are preparing for a hearing, um, and especially in cases where our primary witness has never done an unemployment insurance hearing, we go through a full mock hearing with them, asking them all of the questions, all the pertinent questions that we believe a hearing officer would ask them. And we step through that process. We work through uh, how did you find out? What rule did they violate? Um, you know, what actions are generally taken in these type of procedures? Are you consistent in applying the same discipline with this employee as you do with all others? I mean, you walk through the entire process and have your witnesses very prepared because uh, if there are delays in answers, that's often perceived as deception. So as a supervisor, if the administrative law judge asks me a question, that I should readily have the answer to, and I take too long to answer, that is often perceived as deception. They think that I am contriving a response to that particular question. Employee chargeability. Now this is the part that is extremely important to us as employers. Uh, in most states, and Tennessee is no exception, uh, they are basically two types of employers. They are reimbursable employers and they are rated employers. In order to be a reimbursable employer, you have to fall into several different categories. You have to be uh, either a not-for-profit, uh, you have to be a public entity, a political subdivision, uh, or uh, other type of governmental agencies. If you fall into one of those categories, then it is possible for you to apply for a reimbursable status. And as a reimbursable employer, you do not pay a quarterly taxes. You um, only pay into the unemployment insurance, in, insurance system when one of your former employees file the claim and draw unemployment insurance benefits. Um, if there are never any claims filed against your account as a reimbursable employer, you never have to pay a dime towards the unemployment insurance system. It is a great status to be able to achieve. Uh, there are a couple drawbacks from being an, a reimbursable employer. Uh, one is that uh, if you're a reimbursable employer, uh, in most states, you're not entitled to a none charge under any circumstances. So a person could quit your job for no reason at all, uh, later go work for another company long enough to uh, remove any disqualification based on their separation from your employment. And if they refile that claim and start to draw benefits, you will have to pay. And that is, uh, that is one of the situations that call a lot of my reimbursable clients a little angst. And I like to tell a story about, and I'll tell it real quick. I like to tell a story about uh, a school district that we represent. And uh, we had a situation where a school bus driver was also a um, pastor in the local community. Uh, at this time, the school district allowed bus drivers to take the buses home after they completed their routes. Uh, therefore, they can start to pick up children in the morning uh, when the next school day began. So this pastor had a uh, church, and what he would do is that uh, on Sundays, he would go around the community in his school bus, pick up his parishioners, and bring them to church. Or he would have uh, one of his under pastors do it. 
Um, when they had revivals, he would take the bus, go from house to house, pick up uh, attendees for the revival. Uh, all the gas that he utilized was uh, paid for by the school district. The bus that he used belonged to the school district. So when the school district found out, uh, they terminated him. He filed a claim for unemployment insurance, uh, was originally denied based on misuse of company property and was not entitled to drug benefits. Well, he went to work for another company, worked about four months, and then that company laid him off. He refiled his claim for that claim year Remember, you have 52 weeks to draw, 26. So he refiled his claim. And because he had been laid off and had worked long enough to remove the disqualification applied by the school district, they started to pay him benefits. When they started to pay him benefits, the benefits he drew were 100% chargeable back to my school district. Uh, it took a lot to come down that superintendent and explain to him why that occurred and, and especially occurred, uh, explain to him how he is still better off using the reimbursable method instead of the taxable method. But we worked that out, but it was a difficult discussion. Uh, the second type of employer is called a rated employer. Uh, rated employers, contributing employers, taxpaying employers, they're all the same thing. That simply means that uh, for private, for-profit employers, you're required to pay a quarterly unemployment insurance taxes. Now, how much you pay in taxes is dependent on how well you manage your unemployment insurance claims and how well you manage separation and how uh, effective your policies and procedures are on hiring, discipline, uh, and training employees. So how do you protect your tax rate? Uh, I say you always, it starts with um, the day that you hire an employee. If you want to prepare uh, to protect your tax rate, uh, hire great employees. Uh, hire employees that are gonna stay with you long, hire the ones that are gonna be uh, extremely productive. Um, implement good employment practices and policies. Uh, train your employees, develop those employees. Uh, make sure that your supervisors are trained and knowledgeable on employee relations and employee communications. Because we know in most cases, uh, employees get upset with the supervisors and they either quit the job or get fired based on uh, employee supervisor relationships. The other thing we say is maintain great records. You need to have all that documentation in place regarding um, policies and procedures, the acknowledgement that they've received and will abide by your policies and procedures. Uh, if they go into our disciplinary process, we need to have uh, copies and records of our disciplinary processes. When we terminate them, we need to have a record of why that person was terminated and written documentation on how we handled that termination. Proactively avoid layoffs. And I say that um, sometimes businesses work in cyclical, cyclical, you know, so they have cycles of employment and unemployment. So if you realize that uh, the summertime, your need for employees is lessened, we try to proactively not replace employees who leave if we're getting close to the summer. And we know that we cannot maintain the same level of employment during the summer as we do now. If you are an industry that has tourism in the summer and you ramp up in the summer, then you proactively work through attrition uh, to be prepared when the winter time comes and you need less employees. Uh, we talked about terminating employees timely and according to your policies. You should submit your um, termination reports to the uh, state agency and respond to all uh, state agency form forms in a timely manner. We say protest charges that you disagree with. If, if a person files a claim and you get uh, a decision from the state agency that you don't agree with, um, file an appeal. Write a request for reconsideration. If you responded late, and they began paying a person and those charges come out 
uh, against you at the end of the quarter, uh, protest them. Maybe the mail was late. I, I know in many states, they have central hub with mail, and especially during COVID-19, mail was extremely late. Sometimes we didn't receive mail at all. I would protest those. And in many cases, if you can show that, hey, I have always been consistent in responding to claims filed against us, and the only reason I didn't respond in this situation is because I did not get the notice. Had I gotten the notice, I would have responded. Just look at my record. Oftentimes, those arguments prevail. So how, how does unemployment impact your tax rate? This is just a brief example um, to show you how much a, an employer who has effectively managed their tax rate would pay versus one where the tax rate has really got out of hand. Uh, in Tennessee, the, tax, the unemployment tax base is $7,000. That means that you pay taxes on the first $7,000 that every single one of your employees earned. Uh, the example that we have here today is based on 100 employees. So uh, in Tennessee, the minimum rate is 0.01%. At 0.1% of the first $7,000, you would pay 70 cents per employee. If you multiply that by 100 employees that you paid that $7,000, um, pay taxes on for your seven thousand dollars. You're talking about seventy dollars that you would pay in taxes for unemployment for that particular tax year, and seventy dollars is very manageable. Um, and I will stop here to compliment Tennessee because Tennessee has one of the lower uh, minimum tax rates that we have in the country. Um, most uh, states start at 0 0.03 and higher but a 0 0.01 is a very favorable tax uh, for employers. And uh, if you can stay at or close to your minimum tax rates, you're in great shape as it relates to unemployment insurance taxes. Uh, the new employer tax rate for uh, Tennessee is 2.7%. And if you apply the same logic uh, for 2.7%, you'll see that you pay $189 per employee and for 100 employees, you would pay $18,900. Do you see the difference in that? Now, I'll tell you that the average tax rate for an employee in the state of Tennessee is right. It's just below 2%. So if we looked at 2%, that, that means that you're paying um, $140 per employee times 100, meaning you're paying $14,000. That's what the average employer in the state of Tennessee would pay uh, in taxes for unemployment insurance benefits. However, if you have had a layoffs, if you have not responded to your uh, claims notices in a timely manner, if you have not protested charges, if you have not filed your wage and tax reports on a timely basis, your tax rate can elevate to the maximum amount. And that maximum amount is 10% in Tennessee. So uh, at a 10% tax rate, you are now paying $700 per employee as opposed to 70 cent per employee. And your taxes for that same 100 employees would be $70,000 as opposed to $70. So if you look at that example, it is clear that if you properly manage your taxes and you properly manage separations, your tax rate will be much lower and your impact on the bottom line will be much greater. The other thing I like to always remind employers is that um, charges remain on your account for more than one year. So if you had charges applied from 2020, those charges could stay on your record for up to three years. And so for each calculation period, each calculation for each tax year, uh, they would utilize some of the same charges that you had three years ago. So we would avoid those charges and never have them apply to our account. Okay. How has COVID impacted um, unemployment insurance benefits? And uh, we've had record numbers on the COVID. Uh, 
that were record UI claims filed uh, during the week of March 28, 2020, that was 6.8 million un new unemployment insurance claims filed. Um, during May of 2020, uh, $23.75 billion were paid in unemployment insurance. And for the uh, calendar year of 2020, uh, the United States paid out over $144 billion in unemployment insurance benefits. Now, we talked about fraud a minute ago. Of that $144 billion paid out in unemployment insurance benefits, they estimate that $600 million was fraud. And the way we protect fraud, protect against fraud is that we respond promptly to, MD, to uh, your Tennessee Unemployment Insurance Agency when we receive a claim. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a second. Trust fund balances in the country have steadily decreased. Um, in 2018, the United States had 66.5 billion dollars uh, of combined trust fund. That increased in 2019 to $75.6 billion. Uh, that was an increase of over $11 billion. But look what happened in 2020. The combined trust funds for all states in the United States decreased by $50 billion and stood at $24,919, effective December 12, 2020. So it, would have gone a little bit lower than that, but the most recent numbers that they had came out uh, effective December 12th, 2020. So who has to replace all of that money that has come out of the trust funds? We said earlier in this presentation that employers fund the system. So employers will have to rebuild the uh, trust funds for their state and combine you know, as a group for the country. Let's look at Tennessee. Now, Tennessee uh, did a little bit better with their trust fund than most states in the country. Uh, I have to commend you guys. Y'all did y'all did well, uh, and you used some uh, very strategic tactics to keep your trust fund uh, healthy. In 2018, Tennessee's trust fund was 1.7175 benefit a billion dollars. Uh, to, in 2019, it was 1.273 billion dollars. And if you look at 2020, you still had $1.156 billion. So you only had a slight increase, um, a decrease in your trust fund as compared to some others. I, I look at uh, a state like uh, New York, whose trust fund went from a healthy uh, about $100 billion to a negative $25 billion uh, in 2020. So some states had devastating losses to their trust fund. The immediate impact on, on uh, employers' taxes uh, is not gonna be significant. Uh, that's because state calculation periods lag. Uh, so the calculations for 2021 have already been done and uh, there were no increases on uh, employers in the state of Tennessee. So your uh, 2021 uh, max and minimum tax rates are the same as they were for 2020. Couple of things you that you guys did that that were different than most states is that uh, the federal government and state governments were relieving most employers of 100% of charges. Uh, so that means that uh, employers were not going to be not going to be required to contribute to the trust fund for COVID-related unemployment benefits that were paid. Uh, in the state of Tennessee. Um, you guys relieved employee of those charges through, uh, through September 30th of uh, 2020. Effective October 1 of 2020, employers were, reliable, were liable for COVID-related uh, charges. The other thing that happened in Tennessee is that um, your governor allocated CARES fund money to the Tennessee Trust Fund to ensure that it stayed above $1 billion. There's an automatic uh, tax um, increase mechanism built into your law that if your trust fund falls below $1 billion 
a tax increase is automatic. And that tax increase could have impacted some employees by as much as 300%. So uh, by adding COVID money or CARES money to the trust fund, that avoided a substantial tax increase for most Tennessee employers. Uh, the big thing with uh, COVID is that the federal government gave $600 weekly subsidy uh, to everyone who were drawing state unemployment insurance benefits. So if I were able to draw $275 in the state of Tennessee for, for state benefits, then the federal government also gave me $600 to add to that. So at this point I could earn uh, $875 in unemployment insurance benefits. Now that had some down, downstream ripple effects. And, and one, especially in, in uh, the retail industry, in the restaurant and food and service industries, uh, employees were making more money during unemployment than they could coming back to work. So when employers started to open up and recall former employees back to work, the employees refused those jobs because they would work they would make less by working than they were not working and drawing benefits. Okay, I got to wrap it up real quick. Uh, we had 151. Um, I'm going to stop here to see if you have any questions or if you want to share any uh, unemployment horror stories that you may have, because uh, we I got a ton of them. So at this point, uh, David, are there any uh, questions in the chat? I there's none in the chat, but some people might actually be more comfortable uh, if we opened up their microphones. Uh, some might not be able to find the little chat box. So if it's more convenient for you to uh, just uh, ask the question, we can uh, open that up. I, I, I can see Ken is opening up the microphones right now. So if you have a question, feel comfortable and, and just ask. We don't mind at all. I, I thought, you know, Kurt, Curtis, I thought it was really interesting. I know there may be other states represented here with some of the attendees, but I really thought it was really neat how, uh, uh, you know, how well Tennessee has done. And we're very happy to hear that and a little bit surprised, but it looks like the governor probably made a, some good choices and some other, other things that happened. When I look at states like um, oh, the audience does, I apologize. The audience does need to unmute, unmute themselves. Now they have the ability to unmute. I do apologize. Yeah. If you were trying to ask a question and you couldn't unmute or couldn't be heard, that's my fault. Yeah. Just click the button. There should be at the bottom of your screen, I believe a button or somewhere where you can see where you can unmute. So feel free to ask and interrupt <clears throat> my rambling. Yeah. <laughs> David, when I when I look at states like Louisiana and Georgia, uh, Tennessee performed extremely well. Uh, even our home state of Mississippi, our trust fund, our trust fund was hit fairly significantly. Also, um, we did not go into the red, but uh, it was substantially reduced. And I, and I'll take it that uh, in speaking with some of the unemployment agencies, there are strategies being formulated to uh, build those trust funds back uh, in uh, Louisiana and and uh, in Mississippi and Alabama, I believe, uh, we've talked to agencies and they're looking at putting a levying and assessment against employers um, to, to refund that trust. Uh, some states will add what we call a socialized cost or a general tax to all employers. Um, and, and we've been through that before uh, where uh, the state government would say, we're going to apply a general tax to your account. That general tax is 0.06%. And every employer that pays tax in the state would pay that additional assessment. Yeah. Anybody have a particular claim right now that maybe there's a, a little problem area? Just maybe you could just ask that question and perhaps Kernis could uh, relate to to you and help you out with something. I, I would ask if any of our uh, participants had problems with fraud claims and if they did, how did they address those fraud claims?
Okay. I don't <laughs> think we have any questions at all, David. I don't sound like we do. So I want to thank everyone that again took their, their time today to, to uh, uh, listen to the webinar today. And again, if you want to have uh, an additional question, I'm going to email everyone with that information I uh, promised. And you can also ask a question at that time. So thank you all for attending. And we are going to now wrap up our webinar. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I appreciate you. Thank you, Curtis.